Hi, welcome to the Friends of the Alameda Library's virtual, virtual author events. Today, we're delighted to welcome Susan Cox, the author of the San Francisco Mysteries, The Man on, on the Washing Machine and The Man in the Microwave Oven. My name is David Beal, and I represent the Friends of the Alameda Free Library in Alameda, California. The Friends is an advocacy group that supports our outstanding library through volunteerism and monetary support. The pandemic inspired us to take our community programs online, and we've been delighted by the popularity of our virtual events. We love connecting with you and sharing experiences with, with, the, uh, with authors and museum docents. We were also inspired to develop a virtual used bookstore th uh, through our website, alamedafriends.com. The site offers used books and grab bags with delivery throughout the city. We're able to provide these programs uh, through our donors. Uh, and we ask that you uh, uh, consider a donation in any amount that is comfortable to you uh, by our website, alamedafriends.com. Uh, a little later in the program, we will post a link to donate in our chat feature of this program. Before we get started, uh, there are a few technical details. This is a webinar and it will be recorded. Our audience has about 50 registrations. Your microphones are muted and cameras are turned off. We encourage you to use the chat feature to introduce yourself. Let others in the audience know where you're from. That's always kind of fun for people to hear. Uh, also, uh, just as a way for you to get into chat, um, I'd like to suggest to you that um, in the background here uh, on my screen, I have the Golden Gate Bridge and just, uh, I have it because our mysteries are very, very much centered in, um, in San Francisco. And I remember walking on this bridge at the uh, anniversary, the famous 75th anniversary. And I'm wondering how many of you also did that. If you did, how about sending a chat uh, to let us know. Anyway, on to our program. Susan is joining us this evening from Florida. Uh, on her website, she says, quote, I, I feel lucky to be equally at home in California and Florida with a large and boisterous extended family in England, including 23 cousins, which even to me seem like a lot, unquote. <laughs> she wears a Starfleet communicator pin and a Mystery Writers of America membership pin but sell them both at the, at the same time. A former newspaper reporter, she's also designed marketing and public relations for Safari Park, raised funds for nonprofit organizations, been president of the Palm Beach County Attractions Association and served on the board of the state chapter of the Women's National Book Association. Her first book, The Man on the Washing on the washing machine, won the Mystery Writers of America slash Minotaur Books First Crime Novel Award. So we're delighted to welcome her tonight. How are you doing this evening, Susan? I'm doing just great, David. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to participate here. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think I think the audience would like to hear a little about your history, whether growing up you aspired to be a writer and any other influences on your development. Well, I, I began uh, my professional career as uh, a journalist, actually, um, he, here in Florida back in the day. Uh, I worked for the Sun Sentinel um, uh, for several years. And then when we moved to California, I changed careers and I was a nonprofit fundraiser for most of the rest of my career. Um, so I, all of those things, both of those things, I should say, you know, inc included a great deal of writing. And so I, I've essentially been a writer all of my professional life. Um, I'll give you a sort of a little bit of a, a potted history, if you like. Um, 
when I wanted very much to be a novelist. I've always been fascinated by mysteries, always loved them, and I will tell you some of my favorites later on, but um, it's always been a dream of mine to be a, a published novelist. So when I was able to consider leaving my work, leaving my job to become a full-time writer, that was, that was essentially sort of the dream of a lifetime. I was able, wasn't able to add a couple of hours at the beginning or the end of my day, the way so many other people are capable of doing. Frankly, I'm not an early morning person or a late night person, but as somebody once said, I can rock 11 a.m. like nobody's business. <laughs> so um, I, was never, um, I was never able to sort of make a much longer day for myself. So I decided to, to leave my job. This would be about six years ago. Um, and give being a full-time writer, a, a novelist, a, a chance. Um, I wasn't absolutely sure that I could do it, obviously, um, but writers don't make a lot of money. I mean, that's also something that's probably worth saying, um, especially first-time novelists. But writers in general tend not to be very well-to-do, unless you're James Patterson or J.K. Rowling or... or uh, somebody like that. Um, and so it was, it was a, a fairly big step for me to decide to quit, like I said, quit my job and, and give, it a, give it a go. So um, I guess it was an if not now, when moment for me. And I have to say that the first few months were a little alarming because of course you don't get a lot of feedback. There's not a lot of, um, you're working alone, or at least I was working alone, and um, it was it was a, a little scary, a little scary. But at the same time, I had just recently read about this national contest. Um, the Mystery Writers of America uh, works with Minotaur Books, which is one of the New York Publishing World's big six publishers, and they do this every year. Um, you, you must be an unpublished writer, and I'll give you the website a little later in case there's anyone on board here who would like to uh, participate in the contest. It's very well worth doing. Um, there are probably 500 manuscripts submitted every year. And the Mystery Writers of America role, and this is the impressive part actually, the Mystery Writers of America volunteers vet the first 500 of those um, manuscripts. It's an, an enormous undertaking with completely volunteer, just for the love of it, if you like. So they then submit a shortlist to Minotaur Books and the ed executive editorial staff at Minotaur Books makes the final decision. I believe they, they usually submit about a dozen of, their, of, the, of the sort of top books as it were. And so um, I submitted the, my manuscript, which by the way, not everybody knows this. It was actually the, my um, thesis project for a Master of Fine Arts degree I was taking at the University of San Francisco. And that was some years before. And in fact, anyone who's interested can actually see it there under its original name. I used to call it, or then those days, it was called The Gates of Sleep. And it's in the, in the library at USF. But anyway, I, I polished and repolished and rewrote and changed the murderer and did all of those things before I submitted it. But, um, and then you have about four months or so to wait from the time you submit it until the time that it's, uh, the winner is announced. And that, of course, is like buying a lottery ticket You've, or, or Schrodinger's cat experiment. You've neither won nor haven't you won um, for those months. Um, so it, it was kind of exciting in a way. You know, I, I, um, I had, was able to dream about being a published novelist um, without actually knowing one way or the other. So, but, but however, although I had no expectations of winning, I, I did, <laughs> I did win. And um, it was one of the most exciting things in my life. I have to say the, the, the prize is considerable. It's, um, it's a $10,000 uh, 
publishing contract, which means they give you the $10,000 and then publish the book for you or publish the book. Um, and then the $10,000 is essentially um, yours to keep. And, you know, they sort of, when you sell more books than earns them $10,000, you might actually earn some extra money on top of that. So it's a, a real publishing contract. And uh, $10,000 is even nowadays quite a respectable amount, um, especially for a first time author. So um, so that was, that was it. I, they flew me to New York. I was living in San Francisco at the time, flew me to New York, gave me one of the best weekends of my life. I went to the um, Edgar Awards ceremony, which is kind of like the Mystery World's Oscars, um, and where the um, presentation was made by the publisher. And it was, it was wonderful. I have to say it was absolutely wonderful. So... Um, I, I would encourage anybody who's listening and who actually may have a book that they feel might be worth doing so to submit to the contest. It's, it's quite wonderful. And it's, it is, has a certain amount of prestige attached, obviously. It, there is not a winner chosen every year. So you, um, so which adds a kind of a certain cachet too, because they only choose year, a, a winner in years where there are really quality entries. Mm -hmm. This year's entry, by the way, is um, Murder in Old Bombay by um, a young writer called Nev Marsh. And it's a historical, based on, on, a, on a historical fact, very interesting story. And um, it is just, and this is the exciting, this is the exciting thing. Not only did she win this contest and the publishing contract that came with it, she has been um, nominated for an Edgar Award, which is, you, you know, even even more grand and wonderful. So um, the, the Edgars are usually presented at the end of April or the beginning of May. So it's, it's quite a it's quite a big thing. Is it tomorrow? Yes. Yeah. Well, well there you go. You you better informed than I. I lost track of the date. Mm. Um, so anyway, it's it's mm. it's really thrilling. So, um, and every year there's some real, really quality books come out of that contest. So anyway, I, I would encourage you to do that if, um, if anybody is, uh, has got a book sort of waiting to be, uh, to be read. The, de the deadline is in December. So you have time if you haven't written it already. So, <laughs> so um, by the way, one of the things I thought would be fun during the course of the next few minutes is... Um, and I know we, David, we talked about this, but I thought this would be fun and I figured out a way to do it. I'm going to in intersperse a couple of questions over the course of the next 15 minutes or so that are based on my books. And so anybody listening, just write this down and get the answers. And then um, I'll give you my website address. You can, the first five people that give me the correct answers to these questions, I'll send you something. It's a, a very nice gift. I had some guest soaps actually uh, commissioned, um, which are purporting to be from my uh, heroine's um, business. Mm. And uh, I will send you uh, a gift of those, of those, uh, those guest soaps. So um, the first question, and here it is, and they're easy, easy questions if you've read the book. Even if you haven't, you can look it up. I want the name of Theo's dog. Okay, question number one. Um, okay, so let's see, what else? Um, I suppose after the, the next question that people will ask me and, and perhaps might be interesting to hear is, was, it, was being a published author everything you'd hoped? And it was, yes. <laughs> It was the thrill of a lifetime. It was absolutely wonderful. Not only the original weekend, which was just terrific, and, actually, and having a dear friend with me at the time was just a thrill. But the whole experience of the next 18 months was um, very interesting and a learning experience, I think. Um, one of the things that... Um, people are unaware of now, especially since so much, so many books now are sort of self-edited or not edited very well. Um, one of the reasons that it takes so long for a traditionally published book to 
make an appearance, and it was 18 months later before I actually saw the book in my hands, is that a series of very expert editors um, go through the book. So you have the um, experience of having really very, very well-trained and experienced editors look at your work, make suggestions. Some of the easy, easy things that, you know, can be changed are, you know, have I remembered to put a, something on a Tuesday that should have happened on a Thursday? All of those small things they capture, but they capture the bigger things as well. One of the things that I was uh, told, and it was, it, was, it was such an interesting thought because I had lived with these characters for so long. Um, one, of, one of the first editor who read it said, you know, your character's a little depressed. <laughs> you need to cheer her up a little bit. So it, there was no sort of specifics there and it was not micromanaging in any way, but it was a very insightful thing to, for her to say. So I was able to do that. I cheered her up. I removed one or two of the really terrible things that might've happened to her and um, made a better book you know, at the end. I thought, David, I might read a, a, just a brief chapter, not a chapter, a brief passage um, from, from the first book. Is that, is that a Yeah, good? that's a good thing. Okay. Um, this is from the, uh, the man on the washing machine, which was the, the, uh, the prize winner, the first book. Um, and I'll set the scene for you. Um, Theo is taking her dog down the back to, to, into the sort of the community garden behind her home, behind her apartment for her evening outing. And this is what happens. I won't mention the dog's name because we know that's question number one that you're supposed to be answering. So she and I spent 10 minutes in the darkened garden, me hissing at her to hurry up and she furtive and uncooperative, taking exactly the same amount of time as usual. I could hear occasionally occasional muffled no noises. Sabina's grandfather, known as Professor D'Alessio, although he'd been retired for a decade or more, goes out after dark to crush snails and slugs. Around the time of the open garden, he redoubles his efforts and spends half the night out there creeping up on unsuspecting gastropods. As if to confirm it, I heard the faint metallic ringing of his hoe. If I'd been paying attention to what I was doing, maybe I wouldn't have been blindsided by what happened next. But as I made my way back up three flights of wooden stairs, wondering if I should soundproof them with sisal matting or something, my mind was dealing with Nicole's promise to get her act together and the new Grove home and Bramwell Turlow and peripherally, peripherally whether I thought him as good looking as Nat did I was carrying a little plastic bag containing the result of Lucy's, oh, I just gave the game away. <laughs> <laughs> the result of Lucy's expedition and remembering an argument I once had with a neighbor who hates animals and what he calls their leavings and trying to recall if it was the oregano or the parsley I'd poured a mug of water on the day before. A self-important little white bottom lit me up the stairs in the pitch dark. I picked up the pot of oregano at the same time pushing the door wide open. The unshaded bulb in the utility room ceiling flashed at me like the beam of a lighthouse. An overweight man in a business suit was standing on my washing machine. There you go. So that's the, um, the denouement, <laughs> or at least is one of the scenes that gave the book its name. So. That's great. <laughs> So um, I, I thought I would talk a little bit because somebody had asked me about, you know, what do you do when you're a first time author? And what I thought I would give you, all right, let me do, wait, before that, I'm going to ask another question now and I won't give you the answer. Okay. <laughs> so question number two, you have one, one was a gimme. So question number two, what is the name of Theo's business? Uh -huh. What is the name of Theo's business? Okay. Now, um, one of the things I, I, I have, I, I sometimes talk about a little bit is to, to, to say all of the, 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 the crazy things that you do as a first time author. And um, 
there are there are so many things that you can do to commemorate an event like that. And I was prepared to hire sign writers. I mean, I was so excited. But I thought I would show you some of the things that people gave me as gifts um, to commemorate my first novel. So the first one, and this this was it might have been my favorite actually, was from my dear friend Melody, who gave me a whole box of chocolate bars <laughs> with my cover on. Now, how cool is that? Now, most of them got eaten, but I did get, save one as a souvenir. And then another friend gave me this wonderful coffee mug with the cover on. Um, let's see, my husband gave me a t-shirt. Mm. I got notebooks, I got a tote bag, and the best of all vanity plates in the entire world. Look at that. It's on my car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's all, it was all good fun. Um, so then, but let me just sort of tell you a little bit about um, the sort of um, sophomore anxiety that showed in, showed up when the second book was due. Um, it's famously difficult to write another book. For one thing, the, the first book quite often is the result of several years. And in my case, it was it, that was certainly the case. I had time to write and rewrite and write again and change things and polish it until almost all the plating was worn away. Um, the second book is usually done on a much quicker schedule. So um, the publisher is happy, they want the book, they want a second book and they want it in a year which sounds like a lot of time, but really isn't. It isn't a lot of time. Um, so there's a fair amount of pressure to perform and all of the rest of it. Anyway, um, I was just finishing the second book. Oh, uh, the reason that I'm partly, partly explaining this is that I have been asked a few times why there was a long period of time. It's nearly four years between the first book, its appearance and the second, and this is why. So about whenever I had the book finished and almost, almost that day, I had a, a cat burglar, a uh, cat burglary at my home. And he came in while I was sleeping and stole my two laptops, my um, external hard drive, my sort of backup to the backup, which I was using a thumb drive, which I was keeping, I, I saved every week and put it in my purse thinking I could just grab it in case of a fire. But in fact, he stole my purse as well. Um, and then other things too, my phone and my e-reader and different things like that. So, but I was not at the time saving anything to the cloud. It was, the cloud was fairly new. I'm talking about two or three years ago, new to me at any rate. And so it was gone. It, the, the manuscript, which was complete, um, was gone, along with several half-completed manuscripts and some short stories and really the work, basically the work of a decade, it was gone. So there are people I know, and I've met them, who are very capable of just bouncing back after a devastating thing like that. And I learned... I'm not one of them. <laughs> I'm not one of them. I, um, I just took me a long time to get over it. I mean, I, I, when I was talking to my agent about it, perhaps two weeks later, she said, well, just get, get back on the horse, just write, write it again. And I thought, I, there was just no way. There was just no way. It took me months. However, I did, and my publisher, I had to say, was pretty wonderful really more than a little bit wonderful. They were absolutely wonderful. They gave me all the time I needed and um, it turned into nearly two years. So um, I, I was able to reconstruct it. I had uh, some handwritten notes. I had a few pages printed out, not much. Um, and it was fairly recently completed. So I was able in fact to, to reconstruct the, uh, the second book, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't a joyful exercise, let me just put it that way. Um, 
And having said that, I don't know if, well, I, 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 I've I been getting very good reviews. So I'm told that the book is very good, but I don't like it as much as I like the first. Maybe that's the matter of, of um, having a firstborn uh, favorite. I'm not really sure, but let me read you just a very brief passage from the second book. Um, oh, this is the first one again. <laughs> <laughs> Should get my act together here. Try and remember which book I'm dealing with. Oh, and this is, I thought this was interesting because um, I haven't talked much about doing research because I did live in San Francisco for 25 years. So I know the city very, very well, but I do keep up to date. I, I read this, I read the, um, the Chronicle, I read the, even the Examiner. I know that's not a popular option always. Um, and I, tr I try very hard to keep current with what's happening. I watch KPIX and, you know, I just try and keep current. Um, with California law at any rate. So this scene I'm reading you, and I'll explain to you why it caused me issues uh, with research. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is Theo speaking again. And by the way, I have question number three for you. Who is Ben? Who is Ben? Okay, you can just give me a two or three word description of who he is. Okay, here we go. So this is from a scene in The um, Man in the Microwave Oven, which is the book that came out in November. After telephoning Adolphus Pratt so often with questions that even he ran out of patience, I telephoned Honest Eddie's bail bonds. I was expecting whoever answered the phone to sound like a character from Guys and Dolls, but he sounded more like an insurance agent. If bail's granted, he says smoothly, if... It sounds as if your grandfather's being arraigned on a capital offense. The judge may decide he's a flight risk. Didn't you say he was a foreigner? No, he's English. Right, foreign. So if he's feeling generous, the judge will take his passport and set a high bail. How high? Could be a million, could be several. Dollars? Yes, of course, dollars. So I would have to raise the money and turn it over to the court before he can be released? Grandfather was wealthy, but I'm not sure he or I could raise multiple millions overnight. That's where I come in. You raise 10% of the bail and I lend you the rest. It means I'm on the hook to guarantee your grandfather's appearance in court. When he shows up, if the charges are dropped or he's tried and found innocent, you pay me back what I loaned you and I keep the 10% as my fee. If he's found guilty, I made a noise I wasn't proud of. The same applies. I hope that's clear. I swallowed. Yes. How quickly can this be arranged? As soon as bail is set, come to my office. If I think it's a reasonable risk, I'll pay the bond. It might pay a day or two, but we'll get your granddad out of jail. Okay? Okay, so that's the scene. Now, what I didn't know when I was writing that was that California was about to um, get rid of the financial bail system for criminal defendants. And I was still in the middle of writing the book when, or I'd, I'd completed the book, I should say, I'd completed the book when the referendum was on the, on the ballot in California. And I thought, I, I wanted the book to be accurate, but that might almost instantaneously make it inaccurate if, if they had eliminated the bail system. So I dithered and dithered and I know the book was coming out in November of last year, November of uh, 2020. That's when the bail bond uh, act was gonna be voted on. So I thought, well, there's no way I'm, I can know. There's no way I can know. So, and I decided in the interest of um, almost everybody who's read this will have been watching um, police procedurals and detective shows on television for 40 years. Everybody knows what the system means and what it, what it implies. So I thought, well, I'll just, I'll leave it in. And if it's, if it's suddenly inaccurate three months later, well, I'll just have to sort of bite the bullet as it were. So, but I did think about removing the scene and then I thought, well, I, I, I like the scene. I liked Honest Eddie. Um, and so, but it's one of the, 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 uh, 
the difficulties of, of, of staying current when you're when you're um, when you're setting is an actual is a real place. So um, anyway, I thought that was kind of an interesting little thing. There, were, there was another scene um, that I placed on Market Street where there was just a huge tangle of private cars and trams and because of course the historical trams and all sorts of traffic and you know bicycle messengers and all of the rest of it and I learned after I'd written the scene and I did have time to change this that Market Street was about to be closed to private vehicular traffic which would have cut back down on the the sort of hugger mugger that I wanted for the for the background of that scene so um, anyway, so I did in fact change that scene to 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 reflect the new reality. But it's um, it, it can be yeah it can be complicated to sort of keep up to date like that. Um, okay, I have another question. I have another question for you. Um, which one of the characters is from Texas? And this character is in both books. So if you've read either one, you should be in good shape. Which one of the characters is from Texas? Okay. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you, David? Um, well, I go ahead. I'm sorry. I was gonna say, uh, we have one question from the audience right now, which kind of ties in with something I was gonna ask you. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, um, will your cat burglar experience inspire a future novel? And I was gonna ask you, what about the next novel, you know? Okay. Well, I think, yes, I think, you know, it, it's almost everything is Chris to the, to the writer's mill, isn't it? You know, yeah, right. That before, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, I, I think I, I was cautious about, I have not used it yet. And I'm cautious in a way because I, I want to make sure that the character's responses are not my responses because mm. it was such a personal event. Oh, yeah. Right. And my, my own responses, because I, I think about Theo quite a lot. I think, you know, she she's a little bit like me in that she's English, but really she's way more courageous and much more curious than I am. Um, and so I think probably if it happened to her, her response would be different. So I, I have to con consider how, how to make it all work in, in that context. And I mm -hmm. think, um, but yes, absolutely. By the way, FYI, um, he, my burglar was cool. He, um, he was, it, it took a while because he was, I, you have to think that people who are like, doing things like this are not there because they're rocket scientists, right? I mean, <laughs> right. If they were smart, they'd be doing something else. Mm -hmm. So this fellow, in addition to rifling through all of my things and stealing stuff out of my bedroom, by the way, while I was sleeping there, mm -hmm. um, took a, 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 a brand new bottle of lemonade out of my refrigerator and took a drink and then left it behind along with his DNA. <laughs> what a, you know, what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, however, because it was just a property crime and because everything is always very backed up, um, this was even before COVID, um, it took nearly eight months for them to um, sort of, pinpoint who it, who it was. And of course it was somebody who'd been in the system before. So they were, and he, and in the, in the interim time, he robbed somebody else as well. So this is a fellow who, you know, basically has made a career of this and, and was, has now spent some considerable time in jail waiting trial. Now that's the other thing. And this COVID is responsible for this. Everything has been postponed. So I'm getting, I get letters about every two months from the, um, Attorney General's office saying that there's going to be um, a hearing on sentencing. Um, and then it gets postponed. And so this has been happening. I mean, it's still ongoing. The most recent letter that I received, um, and we're now talking about what, two, two and a half years ago. Um, the most recent letter I received is, uh, is supposed to, there's supposed to be a hearing in June. So we'll see. And I, I'm welcome, you know, I've been invited to go and, and I would certainly be interested, if nothing else, because of my mystery writer, curiosity is aroused. Uh, I have no interest in confronting him, but um, uh, would, I would like to see how the process unfolds. So um, 
yeah so that that's that may may yet may yet happen in june when it's when it's supposed to so um so that that's yeah so that's all very exciting so that's ongoing it will certainly make its way into if not the next book then the one after and um, my next book and i i'm looking for a suitably sinister appliance to continue <laughs> as a title right. um, i haven't worked that out yet um mm. but i am i'm writing uh book number three now it's not under contract yet but I hope that will happen in the next couple of months so um and then it, it'll all be going after that so um oh let me let me just slip in another question because I I, I don't want to okay so here we go so that now I'm going to ask you the name of the neighborhood in San Francisco where the books take place I'll accept either one the real one or the uh, imaginary one so the name of the neighborhood in San Francisco where the books take place. Mm. Now that's that's five questions, even though I gave you a gimme on the first one by mistake. So the first five people who give me the right answers and I'll give my website um, now, you can just send an email via my website. It's www.susancox.net, not .com, but .net, susancox.net. Um, I will make sure that you can give me the answers, give me your address, and I'll send you, um, I'll send you the gift as, as a reward for paying such attention, such <laughs> attention. Um, uh, we have another a comment from uh, the, the, the same person who asked about uh, the, your cat burglar experience, uh, who says that you, you're in good company because Hemingway lost all of his early writings when his suitcase was stolen from the train. I don't know if, I didn't know that. Did you know that? I... You know, I did. As a matter of fact, um, yes, I did. I, I, I didn't originally, I didn't know it at the time, but one of the things that my agent said was, you know, you're in good company. And there's this couple of, and she mentioned Hemingway. Um, worse than, it was not just stolen, his, his wife left the thing on the train um, and they were subsequently divorced. I can't imagine why. But, <laughs> <laughs> right. but um, I actually wrote an article for um, my publisher does uh, a sort of a, a mystery magazine of, 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 of online. And I wrote an article about it. I, I did some research trying to sort of probably exercise the ghosts exorcise not exercise. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. um, and so I found it it's actually it's a little less common now because, you know, we, we've all let, learned our lesson and I certainly have learned my lesson and now everything is backed up to the cloud and yeah, I send it to myself via email and it's on Dropbox, it's everywhere. But um, back in the day, I mean, you know, people used to throw things away and, you know, their maids set fire to stuff and, and uh, it, was, right. it was really kind of heartbreaking right. to read. So. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Let's see what else here. Oh, somebody has, has a suggestion for a sinister appliance if you want to hear it. I don't know. I do. Absolutely. Oh, okay. They're, they're wondering about a lawnmower. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, I like it. I'm going to make a note of that because that's nasty. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> and my two cats uh, would, would have a suggestion about a, an appliance too because whenever that vacuum cleaner starts, uh, they are under the bed. You know, mm -hmm. but, yeah. It, it's, anyway. it's, I, the lawnmower, I think, is, is I, I like the lawnmower. Actually, I like the lawnmower. That's <laughs> it's nice. I'm mean, always flashing blades, and yeah, that's, oh, yeah, that's right. got some real, that's right. got some real um, threat pro prospects there. Yes, I, right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I assume that the third book would possibly would probably feature Theo again I mean I yes that's um one of the things that and I know of course you know mystery readers know all of this but it's it's just one of those things that it's we we, we mystery reader and I consider I consider myself a, an avid reader of mysteries by the way um we we kind of like the idea it's like the Hercule Poirot and the Miss um, Marvel and the, you know, Inspector Allen, Roderick Allen and uh, Peter Whimsey. You know, you just kind of like to get to know the detective, even if the detective is an amateur. 
right. in my case that's true but um and it's it sort of eliminates part of the the problem in a, in a way you know you don't have to go go through getting to know somebody new with each book because right. you already know the person so you know you can kind of get, get in get your teeth into the puzzle and and the the interest of the uh of the detective uh, story, of the mystery story. So, um, and I do think of myself as a, a traditional a writer of traditional mysteries. They're, they're not cozy and they're not hard boiled. They're sort of right down the middle. Um, the puzzle is important. The characters' relationships are important. Um, there's not a whole lot of sex or violence. Um, in fact, almost none really. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's where my own comfort level lies. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly love the golden age mysteries, you know, the Agatha Christie's, Dorothy Sayers, Nio Marsh, um, and more recently the Dick Francis, and, um, and of course they're all dead. So I will give you an alive one as well. Peter Lovesy, who is yeah, right. definitely, um, you know, sort of a, a member of that, that crew. I have the deepest respect and, and uh, fondness for, his, for him and his books. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so they're, they're, they're sort of my, mentally at any rate, they're my mentors as far as my, my books are concerned. I seem to remember, I'm, I'm not sure where I saw this, I, maybe on your website that uh, when you were at the Edgars, after you won it, uh, it seems like Peter Lovesey was there also or, or, or not? Know, no, he, he was not, but you know, this is actually, this is kind of a little sidelight that people might find interesting. Um, you, you've, you're aware, of course, that, um, especially for a first time author, but, but for other authors as well, you will often see little blurbs from other writers on the covers saying, you know, I really enjoyed this book and blah, blah, blah. You, you'll enjoy it too type of thing. Um, what I didn't know until I'd actually had that experience myself um, is that I was going to be responsible for asking for these things. Um, publishers don't like to simply go to their same stable of people all the time because then everybody knows that, oh, well, it's just another one of their writers, you know, they're just saying nice things because they have to or because they're part of the same club or whatever. So I, I, I thought, well, how am I ever going to do this? I, I, I had no contacts really to speak of. So, but I made a short list of people that I thought I would love to hear, to have, a, you know, a blurb on my book from one of these people or any of these people. And I, I contacted them through their uh, websites. Mm. And Peter Lovesy. I, by the way, nobody turned me down. I, I, I can't say enough about how wonderful the mystery writing community is. Nobody turned me down. They, they all said, yes, I'd be happy to do that. Have, the, have your publisher send me the book. I'll read it. I'll, you know, they were great. But, but the, the lion of the group, as it were, and the one I was most surprised by was Peter Lovesy, mm -hmm. who was, couldn't have been more gracious. I mean, it's not as if the man's got nothing else to do. I mean, he writes any number of books. I think he's written something like 60 of them and he's still writing a book a year. And um, he gave me a wonderful cover quote for the, for the man in, on the washing machine. And I, like I said, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he has a slave for life, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. right. Um, this is a question that I asked all of our authors recently and that is will you be going back to your home country at all i'm, I'm thinking in terms of of england not your <laughs> home but your ancestral co country i guess uh, um, uh, we had asked this of uh, young chang who was from china and deepa anapara who's from india mm -hmm. and, uh, they, they don't have any plans to go back but are you planning to visit all your cousins over there or? <laughs> All 23 of them. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I had hoped actually to go back last year. And uh, but of course, you know, like everybody else, you know, our, our plans were truncated by the COVID quarantine. Uh, so okay. and they're still having a very difficult time of it over there. So I'm not I'm not I, I had hoped to go back at some point this year, but I'm not mm. even sure now that that's that it might have to be the, the year after. Okay. So. Mm. Yeah. 
Well, let's see if we have, uh, maybe I'll ask my backstage helpers if they have any other questions. Uh, Karen Manuel or Karen Romer, got anything for us? I'm not seeing anything in the chat from them. Um, no, I don't have anything for you. Okay, well, there's Karen Romer. Okay. Uh, oh, here's Karen Romer says, your characters are wonderfully quirky do you have a favorite and how did you come up with that one? Ah. Well, I don't have a favorite because that's, you know, like asking a parent, do they have a favorite child? So of course mm. they say no, even if it's not absolutely true. But I will say that I, I was very fond uh, as of, the, of the grandfather character yeah. in the first book. I liked him a lot. And in fact, I, the reason the, the, uh, the plot for the second book came out of my liking, I wanted to give him a sort of a larger uh, part to play in the, um, in the second book. And um, some of his sort of history as he, he was, um, it, it's mentioned in the first book that he was an MI5 or MI6 spy, basically in his early years. So I thought that might kind of make an interesting little subplot. So I was able to a, bring, bring some of that history in. My own father was, a, a, well, anyway, he, he has a history of that as well. So I, I had some stories to sort of some very lightweight stories to, to fall back on. But um, when um, I was able to get him, I wanted to sort of get his relationship with Theo to develop a little bit more. And I thought, well, if he was uh, suspected of murder, that might do it. It would give her a reason to investigate and also develop their, their relationship some more. So mm -hmm. I, I like that very much. And I, I based him to some extent on my own grandfather, not, not that my grandfather was um, an Earl, <laughs> not at all, but um, some of his attitudes and just some of, some of the way he is with Theo um, came from, from what I remember of my own grandfather. Um, let's see, um, when you said that he might be your favorite, uh, uh, Karen Romer came back and said, me too. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, another question is, do you find that your characters speak to you? Um, you know, they, you mean, I, cause I've heard other authors say that they almost like, in, in some cases, they're almost dictated to by their characters. They're just sort of writing down what the character, that doesn't happen to me, but what does happen, what does happen, and this is, this is very frustrating, is that between books, I wonder about them and how they're doing in between. I think, uh, hey, what are they doing now? <laughs> you know, how are they? How are they getting along? Did that other thing ever, you know, was that a problem for them? You know, I, I really do. I, they become very real um, in, in, a, in a, a curious way. So that even when I'm writing them, I'm making making it up, obviously. Um, they, they, they become very real to us. Um, yeah. So um, I, I find... I find them a little bit problematic, actually. I, I have a lot of trouble. No, no, that's not true. I don't have a lot of trouble, but I do have some difficulty because my characters run the, the gamut in age. I have a teenager and I have um, a septuagenarian and everybody, it's almost everybody in between. And I, I, really, I really do have to switch. You know, I, switching between them can be difficult sometimes. Mm. But having said that, it's also part of the joy of it. You know, it's sort of nothing, nothing boring ever happens. You know, it's always interesting. I don't write for many hours a day. I write for perhaps two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. That's about my limit wow. um, of concentration. I know there are some people who can write for 15 hours a day. Not me. No, I can't do that. But when I'm, when I'm concentrating, I'm concentrating. And I, I do enjoy them. I, 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 I like I like each of them for different reasons, you know. Mm. Yeah. Um, another question is: uh, Might the pandemic feature in any in a future book? What do you? Th what, that's interesting. What What do you think about that? I, I'm, <laughs> I'm of two minds. It's certainly okay. 
One of the things that's been rather dramatic when you look at um, when you sort of look at news items and look at YouTube videos and things is to look at the cities that are so familiar to us: New York, New Orleans, San Francisco, Minnesota, Chicago, mm -hmm. Minnesota, Minneapolis. I mean, Chicago, and the the streets are empty. Mm -hmm. You know, for those for those nine ten months, you know, there was nobody. There was nobody in the streets stores were closed it was just eerie now having said that you don't really want that in a murder mystery you want a lot of people backing and foring and chewing and throwing and going into places and doing things um so for, because because the bad guy or the bad woman in, in some cases would be like a sore thumb, right? Wandering down Market Street completely alone, you'd know with the bloody knife in their hand, you'd know, you'd know right away who they were. So um, it's more difficult to hide, um, you know, in, in, a, in a pandemic. It's, it's also kind of depressing. I think, people, I think people are reading books to stay, to sort of escape from it. Mm. Um, having said that, I have actually... I have actually been told that there are some really excellent um, new novels that take place during the pandemic. So I, I'll look forward to reading them and seeing how the the, uh, the authors kind of, you know, solve the problems. I have another question from our audience is, did you participate in any writer's groups uh, for feedback while you were writing that first book? I did. Oh, I did. Okay. I, I was incredibly fortunate actually. Um, I had a writer's group of um, four or five other mystery writers, mm. published mystery writers, absolutely wonderful women, all of them women. And they were just great. They were absolutely great. Um, and in, it was incredibly helpful. They were, they gave me feedback. You know, we were sort of exchanging work and we were all, it was, it was, it was a, a lovely little, um, um, group. Um, Lu I, I'll mention some of their names. Louise Ewer, who has written two or three excellent novels. Um, Judy Judith Grieber, who wrote as Gillian Roberts. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, she was just wonderful. Um, um, oh, Linda Grant. Um, and again, um, Susan Dunlap. San Francisco writers, generous to a fault, honestly, with their time and their, their energy. So they were just wonderful. Um, and I, I really, when I, I wrote the second book, when I was here in Florida, and it was, I, I'd moved here for, for family reasons. It was a, 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 difficult, a difficult move, but, um, and so I, I didn't have them this time and for the second book. And it, it, was, it, was, it was a wrench, I must say. Hmm. Um, but I was able to uh, connect with another writer. Um, her name is McGarvey Black, and she has written some really excellent books as well. So there were just the two of us in that particular group, but it, it's always really helpful to, to have another set of eyes on, um, on your work. Um, yeah, so, so I, 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 owe, I owe a debt of gratitude to, to all of those women. Uh, I think I've got about one more question for you here from uh, from our audience, and that is, here's somebody who I don't think has read the books. They want to know if any of the characters have red hair like you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Yes, as like, a matter of fact. <laughs> like this one here. That's the one. Yeah. That's the one. She, uh, she, she does indeed. And now... Um, Theo, who is the, the sleuth, is actually lives in a secret life. She's in San Francisco undercover, if you will. Um, and uh, so she she's a natural born blonde, but she dyes her hair red as part of her disguise. So that counts. That counts. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that is. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that looks to be all the questions we have right now, uh, okay. Susan. So um, I want to thank you for a wonderful um, talk and thank you for two wonderful books. And we'll be anxiously waiting, waiting the next one. Well, so. thank you. It's, it's, it's been such a pleasure. This is, 
This is such fun. You know, the, the um, quarantine has kind of kept us all separate for such a long time, but this is really, it's, it's as good as it gets at the moment to be able to talk to you and listen to people or tell us, have people ask me questions. I, I do love that. Yeah. So I, I will ask, um, just don't forget that if you have the answer to those questions, susancox.net, okay? Send me the answers. Okay, thank you, Susan. Um, and I, I wanted to say, and next time you're in California, uh, I hope you could get across the water to Alameda and we'd love to give you a tour of our beautiful library and show you around our beautiful city. So, I would love it. I, if, yeah. if, if my plans work out, I'll be there this summer. So I will, I will make, make a point of it. I'd love that. Okay, that'd be, that'd be great. Well, thank you very much, Susan. Um, Folks, before we go, uh, I wanted to remind you one more time that we do depend on your donations uh, to put on these programs. We're, we've posted that link in the chat to make it easier for you to do that. Our goal is to see that the library can live long and prosper as someone with a Starfleet communicator <laughs> pin might say. Also, I want to remind you of a few upcoming programs with, with a surprise at the end. Next Wednesday on the 5th of May we, uh, at 7 o'clock, we'll have uh, Carolyn Kim, the author of the award-winning collection, The Prince of Mournful Thoughts and Other Stories. She, she will be reading a bit from her book, as well as discussing some of its themes. We feel it will be of special interest in this time of heightened awareness of uh, the Asian and Asian American communities. Then on uh, May 12th at 7, we're going to welcome the uh, wonderful docent from the San Francisco uh, Museum of Fine Arts, uh, Catherine Zupsik, uh, for a program on the museum's uh, Calder Picasso exhibit, which uh, as a lot of you know is in the city right now. Um, some of you might remember Catherine from her uh, fabulous talks on Frida Kahlo that we had last year. And finally, a surprise for us, uh, on June the 9th at 7 p.m., we'll have the activist and author and speaker and, and award winner, George Takai. Um, he will be, uh, I, I mis mispronounced his name as George Takei, I'm sorry. For all those years I'd been saying Takei and uh, uh, then just as we signed him up, we found out that's not the right, right way to pronounce it. Anyway, George Takei, he will be talking about his graphic novel, They, they Called Us Enemy. And it's about his childhood experiences in World War II in one of the internment camps here in this country. Those of you who are Star Trek fans know who George is. For those who, uh, who aren't, uh, he was Mr. Sulu, the helmsman on the Starship Enterprise. So we're looking forward to that, uh, that event uh, with uh, great anticipation. Um, so that's our story. I, I want to thank uh, our behind the, scene, behind the scenes helpers, Karen Romer and Karen Manuel, who are instrumental in producing these events. Also, uh, Becky Sear and Billy uh, Reinschmidt, who help with the website and the recordings. And don't forget, this has been recorded and it'll be up on our website uh, uh, in a day or two. And of course, thanks again to Susan for her wonderful books and a delightful presentation. Finally, I thank you, the audience, who make these events so enjoyable. So have a good evening and we'll see you next time.